Chapter 15 The Six Ghosts of Fear Before you can put any portion of this philosophy into successful use, your mind must be prepared to receive it. The preparation is not difficult. It begins with study, analysis, and understanding of three enemies, which you shall have to clear out. These are indecision, doubt, and fear. The sixth sense will never function while these three negatives, or any of them, remain in your mind. The members of this unholy trio are closely related. Where one is found, the other two are close at hand. Indecision is the seedling of fear. Remember this as you read. Indecision crystallizes into doubt. The two blend and become fear. The blending process often is slow. This is one reason why these three enemies are so dangerous. They germinate and grow without their presence being observed. The remainder of this chapter describes an end which must be attained before the philosophy as a whole can be put into practical use. It also analyzes a condition which has, but lately, reduced huge numbers of people to poverty, and it states a truth which must be understood by all who accumulate riches, whether measured in terms of money or a state of mind of far greater value than money. The purpose of this chapter is to turn the spotlight of attention upon the cause and the cure of the six basic fears. Before we can master an enemy we must know its name, its habits and its place of abode. As you read, analyze yourself carefully, and determine which, if any, of the six common fears have attached themselves to you. Do not be deceived by the habits of these subtle enemies. Sometimes they remain hidden in the subconscious mind, where they are difficult to locate, and still more difficult to eliminate. There are six basic fears with some combination of which every human suffers at one time or another. Most people are fortunate if they do not suffer from the entire six. Named in the order of their most common appearance, they are the fear of poverty, the fear of criticism, the fear of ill health, the fear of loss of love of someone, the fear of old age, the fear of death. All other fears are of minor importance. They can be grouped under these six headings. Take inventory of yourself as you read this closing chapter and find out how many of the ghosts are standing in your way. Fears are nothing more than states of mind. One state of mind is subject to control and direction. Physicians, as everyone knows, are less subject to attack by disease than ordinary laymen, for the reason that physicians do not fear disease. Physicians without fear or hesitation have been known to physically contact hundreds of people daily who were suffering from such contagious diseases as smallpox, without becoming infected. Their immunity against the disease consisted largely, if not solely, in their absolute lack of fear. Man can create nothing which he does not first conceive in the form of an impulse of thought. Following this statement comes another of still greater importance, namely, man's thought impulses begin immediately to translate themselves into their physical equivalent, whether those thoughts are voluntary or involuntary. We are here laying the foundation for the presentation of a fact of great importance to the person who does not understand why some people appear to be lucky while others of equal or greater ability, training, experience, and brain capacity seem destined to ride with misfortune. This fact may be explained by the statement that every human being has the ability to completely control his own mind, and with this control, obviously, every person may open his mind to the tramp thought impulses which are being released by other brains or close the doors tightly, and admit only thought impulses of his own choice. Nature has endowed man with absolute control over but one thing, and that is thought. This fact, coupled with the additional fact that everything which man creates, begins in the form of a thought, leads one very near to the principle by which fear may be mastered. If it is true that all thought has a tendency to clothe itself in its physical equivalent, and this is true beyond any reasonable room for doubt, it is equally true that thought impulses of fear and poverty cannot be translated into terms of courage and financial gain. The Fear of Poverty There can be no compromise between poverty and riches. The two roads that lead to poverty and riches travel in opposite directions. If you want riches, you must refuse to accept any circumstance that leads toward poverty. The word riches is here used in its broadest sense, meaning financial, spiritual, mental, and material estates. The starting point of the path that leads to riches is desire. In chapter 1 you received full instructions for the proper use of desire. In this chapter on fear, you have complete instructions for preparing your mind to make practical use of desire. Here then, 
is the place to give yourself a challenge which will definitely determine how much of this philosophy you have absorbed. Here is the point at which you can turn profit and foretell, accurately, what the future holds in store for you. If, after reading this chapter, you are willing to accept poverty, you may as well make up your mind to receive poverty. This is one decision you cannot avoid. If you demand riches, determine what form and how much will be required to satisfy you. You have been given a roadmap which, if followed, will keep you on the road to riches. If you neglect to make the start or stop before you arrive, no one will be to blame, but you. This responsibility is yours. No alibi will save you from accepting the responsibility if you now fail or refuse to demand riches of life, because the acceptance calls for but one thing. Incidentally, the only thing you can control and that is a state of mind. A state of mind is something that one assumes. It cannot be purchased. It must be created. Fear of poverty is a state of mind, nothing else. But it is sufficient to destroy one's chances of achievement in any undertaking, a truth which became painfully evident during the Depression. This fear paralyzes the faculty of reason, destroys the faculty of imagination, kills off self-reliance, undermines enthusiasm, discourages initiative, leads to uncertainty of purpose, encourages procrastination, wipes out enthusiasm and makes self-control an impossibility. It takes the charm from one's personality, destroys the possibility of accurate thinking, diverts concentration of effort, it masters persistence, turns the willpower into nothingness, destroys ambition, beclouds the memory and invites failure in every conceivable form. It kills love and assassinates the finer emotions of the heart, discourages friendship, and invites disaster in a hundred forms, leads to sleeplessness, misery, and unhappiness in all this. Despite the obvious truth that we live in a world of overabundance of everything the heart could desire, with nothing standing between us and our desires excepting lack of a definite purpose. The Fear of Criticism Just how man originally came by this fear, no one can state definitely, but one thing is certain, he has it in a highly developed form. This author is inclined to attribute the basic fear of criticism to that part of man's inherited nature, which prompts him not only to take away his fellowman's goods and wares, but to justify his action by criticism of his fellowman's character. It is a well-known fact that a thief will criticize the man from whom he steals, that politicians seek office, not by displaying their own virtues and qualifications, but by attempting to besmirch their opponents. We have been describing the manner in which people behave under the influence of fear of criticism as applied to the small and petty things of life. Let us now examine human behavior when this fear affects people in connection with the more important events of human relationship. Take for example practically any person who has reached the age of mental maturity, from 35 to 40 years of age, as a general average. And if you could read the secret thoughts of his mind, you would find a very decided disbelief in most of the fables taught by the majority of the dogmatists and theologians a few decades back. Why does the average person, even in this day of enlightenment, shy away from denying his belief in the fables which were the basis of most of the religions a few decades ago? The answer is, because of the fear of criticism. Men and women have been burned at the stake for daring to express disbelief in ghosts. It is no wonder we have inherited a consciousness which makes us fear criticism. The time was, and not so far in the past, when criticism carried severe punishments. It still does in some countries. The fear of criticism robs man of his initiative, destroys his power of imagination, limits his individuality, takes away his self-reliance and does him damage in a hundred other ways. Parents often do their children irreparable injury by criticizing them. The mother of one of my boyhood chums used to punish him with a switch almost daily, always completing the job with the statement, you'll land in the penitentiary before you are 20. He was sent to a reformatory at the age of 17. Criticism is the one form of service of which everyone has too much. Everyone has a stock of it which is handed out freely, whether called for or not. One's nearest relatives often are the worst offenders. It should be recognized as a crime. In reality, it is a crime of the worst nature for any parent to build inferiority complexes in the mind of a child through unnecessary criticism. Employers who understand human nature get the best there is in men, not by criticism, but by constructive suggestion. Parents may accomplish the same results with their children. Criticism will plant fear in the human heart or resentment, but it will not build love or affection. The Fear of Ill Health this fear may be traced to both physical and social heredity. It is closely associated as to its origin 
with the causes of fear of old age and the fear of death, because it leads one closely to the border of terrible worlds of which man knows not, but concerning which he has been taught some discomforting stories. The opinion is somewhat general also that certain unethical people engaged in the business of selling health have had a lot to do with keeping alive the fear of ill health. In the main, man fears ill health because of the terrible pictures which have been planted in his mind of what may happen if death should overtake him. He also fears it because of the economic toll which it may claim. A reputable physician estimated that 75% of all people who visit physicians for professional service are suffering with hypochondria, imaginary illness. It has been shown most convincingly that the fear of disease, even where there is not the slightest cause for fear, often produces the physical symptoms of the disease feared. Powerful and mighty is the human mind. It builds or it destroys. Playing upon this common weakness of fear of ill health, dispensers of patent medicines have reaped fortunes. There is overwhelming evidence that disease sometimes begins in the form of negative thought impulse. Such an impulse may be passed from one mind to another, by suggestion, or created by an individual in his own mind. Disappointments in business and in love stand at the head of the list of causes of fear of ill health. The Fear of Loss of Love The fear of the loss of love probably dates back to the Stone Age, when men stole women by brute force. They continue to steal females, but their technique has changed. Instead of force, they now use persuasion, the promise of pretty clothes, motor cars, and other bait, much more effective than physical force. Man's habits are the same as they were at the dawn of civilization, but he expresses them differently. Careful analysis has shown that women are more susceptible to this fear than men. This fact is easily explained. Women have learned from experience that men are polygamous by nature, that they are not to be trusted in the hands of rivals. The Fear of Old Age In the main, this fear grows out of two sources. First, the thought that old age may bring with it poverty. Secondly, and by far the most common source of origin from false and cruel teachings of the past, which have been too well mixed with fire and brimstone, and other bogies cunningly designed to enslave man through fear. In the basic fear of old age, man has two very sound reasons for his apprehension, one growing out of his distrust of his fellow men, who may seize whatever worldly goods he may possess, and the other arising from the terrible pictures of the world beyond, which were planted in his mind, through social heredity before he came into full possession of his mind. The possibility of ill health, which is more common as people grow older, is also a contributing cause of this common fear of old age. Eroticism also enters into the cause of the fear of old age, as no man cherishes the thought of diminishing sexual attraction. The most common cause of fear of old age is associated with the possibility of poverty. Poorhouse is not a pretty word. It throws a chill into the mind of every person who faces the possibility of having to spend his declining years on a poor farm. Another contributing cause of the fear of old age is the possibility of loss of freedom and independence, as old age may bring with it the loss of both physical and economic freedom. The Fear of Death To some this is the cruelest of all the basic fears. The reason is obvious. The terrible pangs of fear associated with the thought of death, in the majority of cases, may be charged directly to religious fanaticism. So-called heathen are less afraid of death than the more civilized. For hundreds of millions of years, man has been asking the still unanswered questions, where did I come from, and where am I going? During the darker ages of the past, the more cunning and crafty were not slow to offer the answer to these questions, for a price. While the religious leader may not be able to provide safe conduct into heaven, nor, by lack of such provision, allow the unfortunate to descend into hell, the possibility of the latter seems so terrible that the very thought of it lays hold of the imagination in such a realistic way that it paralyzes reason and sets up the fear of death. This fear is useless. Death will come, no matter what anyone may think about it. Accept it as a necessity and pass the thought out of your mind. It must be a necessity, or it would not come to all. Perhaps it is not as bad as it has been pictured. The entire world is made up of only two things, energy and matter. In elementary physics we learn that neither matter nor energy, the only two realities known to man, can be created nor destroyed. Both matter and energy can be transformed but neither can be destroyed. Life is energy if it is anything. If neither energy nor matter can be destroyed, of course life cannot be destroyed. Life, like other forms of energy, 
may be passed through various processes of transition or change, but it cannot be destroyed. Death is mere transition. If death is not mere change or transition, then nothing comes after death except a long, eternal, peaceful sleep, and sleep is nothing to be feared. Thus you may wipe out forever the fear of death. Worry is a state of mind based upon fear. It works slowly but persistently. It is insidious and subtle. Step by step it digs itself in until it paralyzes one's reasoning faculty, destroys self-confidence and initiative. Worry is a form of sustained fear caused by indecision. Therefore it is a state of the mind which can be controlled. An unsettled mind is helpless. Indecision makes an unsettled mind. Most individuals lack the willpower to reach decisions promptly and to stand by them after they have been made. During periods of economic unrest, such as the world recently experienced, the individual is handicapped, not alone by his inherent nature, to be slow at reaching decisions, but he is influenced by the indecision of others around him who have created a state of mass indecision. You may control your own mind. You have the power to feed it whatever thought impulses you choose. With this privilege goes also the responsibility of using it constructively. You are the master of your own earthly destiny just as surely as you have the power to control your own thoughts. You may influence, direct, and eventually control your own environment, making your life what you want it to be. Or, you may neglect to exercise the privilege which is yours, to make your life to order, thus casting yourself upon the broad sea of circumstance where you will be tossed hither and yon like a chip on the waves of the ocean. In addition to the six basic fears, there is another evil by which people suffer. It constitutes a rich soil in which the seeds of failure grow abundantly. It is so subtle that its presence often is not detected. This affliction cannot properly be classed as a fear. It is more deeply seated and more often fatal than all of the six fears. For want of a better name, let us call this evil susceptibility to negative influences. Without doubt, the most common weakness of all human beings is the habit of leaving their minds open to the negative influence of other people. This weakness is all the more damaging, because most people do not recognize that they are cursed by it, and many who acknowledge it neglect or refuse to correct the evil until it becomes an uncontrollable part of their daily habits. To protect yourself against negative influences, whether of your own making or the result of the activities of negative people around you, recognize that you have a willpower and put it into constant use until it builds a wall of immunity against negative influences in your own mind. Recognize the fact that you and every other human being are by nature lazy, indifferent, and susceptible to all suggestions which harmonize with your weaknesses. Recognize that you are by nature susceptible to all the six basic fears and set up habits for the purpose of counteracting all these fears. Recognize that negative influences often work on you through your subconscious mind. Therefore, they are difficult to detect and keep your mind closed against all people who depress or discourage you in any way. Deliberately seek the company of people who influence you to think and act for yourself. You have absolute control over but one thing, and that is your thoughts. This is the most significant and inspiring of all facts known to man. It reflects man's divine nature. This divine prerogative is the sole means by which you may control your own destiny. If you fail to control your own mind, you may be sure you will control nothing else. Mind control is the result of self-discipline and habit. You either control your mind, or it controls you. There is no hallway compromise. The most practical of all methods for controlling the mind is the habit of keeping it busy with a definite purpose, backed by a definite plan. Study the record of any man who achieves noteworthy success, and you will observe that he has control over his own mind, moreover that he exercises that control, and directs it towards the attainment of definite objectives. Without this control, success is not possible. Previously, you may have had a logical excuse for not having forced life to come through with whatever you asked, but that alibi is now obsolete because you are in possession of the master key that unlocks the door to life's bountiful riches. The master key is intangible, but it is powerful. It is the privilege of creating in your own mind a burning desire for a definite form of riches. There is no penalty for the use of the key, but there is a price you must pay if you do not use it. The price is failure. There is a reward of stupendous proportions if you put the key to use. It is the satisfaction that comes to all who conquer self and force life to pay whatever is asked. The reward is worthy of your effort. Will you make the start and be convinced?
If we are related, said the immortal Emerson, we shall meet. In closing, may I borrow his thought and say, if we are related, we have, through these pages, met. This concludes the Chapter 15, Summary of Think and Grow Rich. Thanks for watching.